Thank you, Payal. And before we start the evening, there are all the other women who join us in welcoming all of you here. There's Nina, Shuli, Ritu, and Anjali who join Payal and me. So in addition to Payal, a very, very happy new year to all of you. Thank you for being here in such large numbers. We thought of starting the evening with a, the year with an intimate because we assumed you would all be holidaying in more exotic climes. But it's great to see all of you here. And uh, the good thing about algebra is that in the, at the end of last year, we had several invitations from people in New York and Dubai and Bombay and Bangalore asking us to start algebra there. But we said, no, we'll stay in Gurgaon. And that's where it all began. That's the chemistry you've created. And do bring lots of your friends in larger numbers so that we can really expand this idea more and more and bring you even more unusual people uh, to experience over here. But really, a big salute to the chemistry that you've created here, because none of this would be possible without the, uh, the quality of audience that you are. Um, you know, algebra, for very few of you who are new here, is meant to be a space for combat and dialogue and challenge. And I hope over this year that we are really able to, and that again comes from a commitment from you, that more and more, I hope that we are able to bring less and less well-known people to you, but more and more unusual people to you. And really, it is your commitment in arriving here that will uh, allow us to do that, to bring worlds that you normally would not encounter. So this evening, it's great to start the new year with the idea of potential. There are two conversations here which really represent the idea of potential both in the public space and in the personal space. We are really looking at an era of jobless growth. It is the concern, the anxiety that really dominates all of our, uh, you know, all of our lives, our national life, and in fact, the global world. In that, there is a particular domain, and we call this conversation the unmapped continent, because it really is that. There is a sphere of our lives that we pay absolutely no attention to, and yet it is almost like Christopher Columbus or Vasco da Gama really discovering an entire new world. This world is waiting to be discovered. And the first speaker we have today is pretty much on the scale of a Christopher Columbus or a Vasco da Gama, really urging our attention to this world, trying to make us discover it. And that world that I speak of is what we loosely call the crafts and the, uh, you know, the creative sector of, of our country, but which Rajiv Sethi has been struggling for years to recognize as creative and cultural industries. In India, there's a very loose figure because there's been no real consent, uh, census done. But it, you know, the, the conservative figure is that 40 million people are involved in the sector. The real figure probably is about 200 million people who can get jobs, very lucrative jobs, very sustainable and meaningful jobs if we focus on this sector. Sunil Munjal, who's a manufacturing uh, czar, recently spoke about how he wants to pivot to this entire sector because there is so much of potential, both commercial, creative, spiritual, cultural, and economic potential uh, in this sector. Just to throw you one more figure, in Britain, there was a survey done by the Cultural Council, the Craft Council of Britain, and there are only about 40,000 people involved in that sector in Britain, but they found that it had contributed 3.5 billion pounds to their economy in one year. That is the potential that we are sitting on and we are blind to. So to have that conversation, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rajiv Sethi, whose resume is so vast that I'm not going to embark upon it. But let me just throw you very small snippets of where he's been and who he is. He counts amongst his mentors, Pupul Jayakar, Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay. He was, he apprenticeshiped with uh, Pierre Kader. Louis Vuitton has invited him to dress many of his windows across the world. He is the original creator of the Festivals of India. He has advised the World Bank uh, ab about cr creative and cultural industries. And he has, of course, most recently created this absolutely stunning scenography at the uh, Terminal 2 in Mumbai, which really marries what modernity and ancient traditions can, can, can come together to create. So ladies and gentlemen, for this really exciting conversation about an unmapped continent, please welcome Rajiv Sethi. Thank you. Thank you. 
deeply privileged show. Um, why do you call it algebra? Why do we call I, it? I actually flunked in algebra. I, I barely passed in geometry. <laughs> Well, it's part of the subversive intent of this club that algebra means nothing to do with maths. Uh, it comes from the word algebra, as you know, which has a wonderful meaning. It means the science of restoration and balance. It also means the coming together of broken parts, which we felt was very relevant to our lives. So, in, 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 in and lost to the wealth of what we know in traditional knowledge to the West. Yes. Lost. Lost. So, algebra is really a way of you know, equating all the things that are lost with all the things that are gained. <laughs> so I hope, really, Rajiv, we are very, very happy to start the year with this conversation because it is really a massive blind spot uh, in our country. And I'm going to ask you to evoke the magic, the potential, all of that. But let's start with the Mumbai project, the, the airport project, because that is so recent. Uh, when, when you were commissioned to do that... Just to put you off guard. Yes. Just bit of Gurgaon. Uh, is everyone here from actually Gurgaon? <laughs> it's, it's, it's really India Gurgaon. It's amazing. I mean, you know, I, I try to avoid any, any, any invite to come here because I, unless I have a very experienced driver, I don't know how to find my way. <laughs> but it's, um, it's, and I used to come here very often because I was doing a, some kind of an artwork program much before the Bombay Airport came into being uh, in one of the, I think, Leela's hotel. And uh, as most of my, my, my efforts in trying to reinterpret imagined realities, I begin with words. It's a very Shabd Pradhan Desh. We are a country that uh, is inspired by the word that sparks an image. And I can't quite remember, but on the way on the car, I suddenly remembered that this is the right kind of a thing to begin with. I wrote a, a, a small poem on the, the theme of the whole artwork was imago, which is that, that little liminal time when a moth turns to a, to a butterfly small time, very liminal. And I said, Gurgaon is like something that's becoming something else, not quite clear about what its self-identities are about. I remember because my mother used to bring me to meet her brother, who used to be some kind of a district magistrate. And coming from Delhi in a Chrysler, we'd have to go through miles of just mustard fields. And I recall these great yellow mustard. And uh, we used to always get off and have our little parathas, like a picnic. It's not a bit like the traffic jams now. But you know, we would sit out there. And I still recall a flock of green parrots flew out of this green mustard field that sort of is embedded in my mind. And this was somewhere, I think, in the um, very early in the 60s. And then in 90s, when I penned that little poem, you brought it with you. I see it's New York, 1995. <coughs> well, it's not New York, but Gurgaon, about 1990-something. And uh, no, I, did, I didn't bring the poem. But I just, as I was driving in, I thought. Well, I have to tell you, Rajiv, you I would, no, I've you got are something. Being I've got something which I, I scribbled and just as I was waiting for everybody. It was called India Gurgaon, and it's called it's a transformative state where, as I said, the pupa turns to moth, and a precinct developed overnight, neither here nor there, and somewhat fledging. Can all of you hear Rajiv at the back? Yeah. Well, notions of imagined identities. And I tried to scribble it, which I couldn't remember, but it was born from the field of mustard with the green parrots. And it, I must say, it, I continue to use the word Gurgao. Uh, Guru Gram is certainly, <laughs> but if I may, your indulgence. Sweet earth, your country plowed no more. Charpoy dreams 
knocked down under groves of banana. New fires struck this golden, golden juices girdle into sugar mounds coagulate. No, sugar mounds coagulate. I, can't, I didn't bring the poem, so I tried to memorize. Coagulate. Forming heights that leave no shadow. From up here, the horizons expand and emails fly as words are formed between earth and sky. So that's a little bit of what I can remember. I know it was much longer. <laughs> well, thank you, Rajiv. You're, you're way better than the last Latin's Delhi guest we had, which was Karan Thapar, where he was so terrified of coming to Gurgaon because he thought it's still a jungle where you meet baboons. And he was very delighted to see the engaged intellectual and cultural uh, audience that he met here, and he's promised to come back all the time. That was very condescending. Very, very. So <laughs> I'm saying you're way better. <laughs> and and you're, think... you're not coming to Gurgaon. The beauty about Delhi and Gurgaon is that the, the, in the past, those who lived in Red Fort must have made poems about those who are living in Latin's Delhi now, and how all of that was a mustard field, you know. <laughs> so, well, Rajiv, so let me, let me take you... Yeah. Let me take you into the project that really astounded everyone. Your project in Bombay uh, Airport, you traveled across the country and said that, you know, you discovered almost 50,000 uh, works of art, uh, craft objects, out of which you chose 6,000, which are now, uh, you know, uh, displayed in the, in the Bombay Airport. Can you just pick three How of... How many have you been to the Bombay Airport? That's still a few. There's some potential there. <laughs> Take a domestic flight um, only on a few airlines. Not all of them land. The, the earlier airport has little to do with me. The new one, uh, where a few airlines, I think, Vedant, Jet Air, Air India, some information. Yeah. We're going Vedanta to. And all these others do. But the others land. So it's a new airport. It was, I think, it's really not me. I think that's really where patronage counts. And I speak to you as people who are patrons, who are people who are, are um, privileged. I, I think it's Sanjay Reddy. I really am a, an instrument, and I'm not being cute. I think it's important to know that, uh, you know, there are, uh, the governments are myopic. They're never going to deliver. Uh, I've had a track record, five decades of working, so I know exactly how where this stems from. But, but Sanjay Reddy, I think, has a, a, a keenness, a kind of passion. And he said, I don't want to make the Bombay airport look like Shanghai or, you know, oh God forbid, Shans Shansi, what's, what's Singapore? The, the, the sexiest one. And I, Shansi or... Shansi. Shansi. Shangi. So, and I really wanted to be Bombay. And so it really came out to be that uh, he wanted to reevaluate what we take for granted and that we wished, should be able to go into the, really into the countryside and bring up things in what is becoming a symbol of contemporary India, indeed, as these glass stars have become. Uh, but this is a different India. Uh, and I think. I jumped in because there's a wonderful um, a kind of guideline in the CPWD, uh, which says that 2% of all expense on building has to go towards arts and craft. How many of you knew that? Because if, and if it's been there from even, 1972. Yeah, 72. Now, if half of you knew that, you would prevent some of the monstrosities that are coming all around you. Or you would question them at least. Not much you can do with prevention nowadays, but you can, you can make a nuisance. You, you're important to become a nuisance and be disruptive. So this 2%, I said, would you pay 2% that's required for a 12,000 crore project for an airport? And this brave man said, let's look at it. Let's go ahead. And that's what really makes things happen. The ideas are a dime a dozen. People like me, again, I'm not being cute. 
are many. There are many, many creative people in this country. But I want to reinvent themselves, reinvent the vocabulary to present something to ourselves in a way that we have never imagined before. So I think that courage is very important. Patronage requires a deep sense of commitment and passion to follow it through. So he said, yes, let's go ahead. So that really started the whole thing. So I bought 7,000 items that were, some of them were ready to be sold off as firewood. Many of them were being whisked off into antique collections abroad. And I've always hated that. I've always, I've built an unwieldy collection of a lack of objects because all the time I'm trying to prevent something from going abroad. So it's saying, And that was happening. So this is really what created the airport. And of course, theme, giving it a theme, thinking in terms of a liminal space where people are going to spend a little time coming and going out and giving them that sense of little something that so, helps them relax. So Rajiv, as, as I was saying that because it's such a blind spot for us, out of all those objects that you've picked... What's can, a blind spot? The, just the potential, the, the sheer rich resource that is all around us and, and that we don't engage with. So out, not, out, of, not, out of all these objects, can you pick two or three which you know, will really evoke the sheer magic that is available, the sheer grandeur of what's available? Uh, no, I, because it's so much been written about and I'm now doing a book that when you're full of something that you're doing, that's one thing that you want to leave behind. But let me speak about something I just saw today. There's this man who does these incredible little, um, he heats tiny little tubes of industrially produced glass. And out of a micro part of it, he, and with his rather agile fingers, very incredible instrument, huh? Only we can do that. Monkeys can't they have long palms to swing on branches. And that has a direct effect on our brain. If, imagine if we stop, if we just do this, which we do every day, then what will happen to this? Anyway, so this particular hand, he just, with his very nimble fingers, is, while I was sitting there, was able to make me one Ganesh, two Ganesh, three Ganesh, eight Ganeshes, 16 Ganeshes, all different. Now this kind of unique ability to improvise what we've called Jugaru, is something that hasn't come from a school. It hasn't come from any pedagogy. It's come from something that's in the womb, isn't it? And then uh, he's able to pride, take pride in the fact that he's able to do everything different. And uh, that, I think, is really the key to India's creativity. As opposed to the hundreds who have to sit copying an American accent at the time when everybody else sleeps and becoming coolie tech. Here is a person who is creating content. And believe me, in a knowledge economy, that is what is going to count. Everything else is, is irrelevant. His his being able to create content with a traditional knowledge system that has constantly evolved. Tradition never is not static. It shifts, it transforms, it alters, it furthers. And I think that's what we are sitting on. We are sitting on, mi not thousands, millions of people like this whose skills have never been mapped. And I think that's the great tragedy. That in spite of all the planning commissions reincarnated into Niti Aayogs, we still haven't understood the incredible potential of people who can do things with skills that the rest of the world doesn't know about. So in fact, uh, Rajiv, you know, you've been struggling for years to shift the vocabulary around this decades, away from crafts. Decades, unfortunately. Decades. Uh, to, as I said, cultural and creative industries.
can you explain that phrase what, what is held within it you know yeah. why do you want that vocabulary to change i did bring this and i don't want to repeat, because this has been in the in the files of the government of india for far too long but um you know we defined uh, i think it was in um it is that i first heard of adorno who talked about cultural industries but you know as a prerogative saying that how can the capitalist appropriate even culture the two words of industry and culture are not good together and culture is something that doesn't belong to people with money alone in fact paradoxically the poorest are the most cultured uh and uh, but subsequently i think wto because issues of uh, intellectual property came up you heard about it when you heard that uh, uh, kargil had taken neem or uh, you know somebody took our colored cottons and redrafted that into something that they patented you felt outraged because this is traditional knowledge and traditional knowledge is copy left it's not copyright it believes in people and and shares it with much greater ease and yet some people make money so invariably the people who are concerned about money people like the world bank people like the world trade organization people like unesco concerned about the issue of proper right to um creation they said no 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 we have to revive creative and cultural industry and the world bank was then held by a man called wolfensen who was very bright and uh, he knew me the president was well, he came asked me whether i would sit in a group uh, of mentors he called them who could redirect the world bank towards policy on culture and creative industries uh, to develop for development to augment the economies the sagging economies of country like ours they didn't call them underdeveloped but they meant underdeveloped we're talking about developing economies so we did set up this group there was amatya sen there was lord rothschild and there was yoyo man myself and we sat for a few meetings and i said you know i'm wasting my time in washington and really talking about something although it was living there was too much jet lag i said why don't <coughs> why not start this in india and i tried to speak to the then planning commission and i agreed after th- um since 86 i've done nothing with the government of india but 2006 i said okay i festivals of india was over and the upnaut sub in famous also was over in 86 so, and i said you, okay that you because you have you you have such a massive footprint that i'm going to keep pulling you back to the no, question no, sure. that i've actually so, asked you that's, 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 that's what i was going to say so are uh, we sat there and nothing happened and nothing happened and it was all shelved i did a 1500 page report nobody read it even this government they had a meeting with the niti ayog they call 17 secretaries to listen but this idea of creative and cultural industry why is it not coming home to us is that what you're asking <laughs> rajiv because yes i know that you did that whole uh, document for the planning commission but you know you have very yeah, well, very you have very influential people in this audience i want you to fire them with the so, idea so, what is creative so why, and cultural industry so, what is its potential so why you know? so you know it's um, it's creating content with what only you can do and each country has something that they can only do it's all enough it's good kuli tech is good everything that you do earn a lot of money it's okay but when you say that it is the future of india and you find that 98% is nothing based on not based on patents but based on doing somebody else's homework while they sleep then you're really not getting further so it's really looking at our own content so at the moment for example at the asian heritage foundation uh, the director of the foundation which is the foundation i set up ankush set is sitting here we started to look at uh all our pictorial traditions whether they be kon tribals or madhubani or the patuas of bengal or the varlis of maharashtra or the sauras of odisha or the miniature painters of rajasthan or the tanjore painters of the south could they not start making animation paintings creating their own content now just merely putting a dhoti 
on Spider-Man is not creating content for us. It's not going to get us any money. It's going to get somebody else money. We have to create our own content. We have to have our own Mickey Mouses and all that. That's what Walt Disney did. But what do we do? We've got huge mythos. We've got mythology which would put anybody to shame. Do we not? We need to need to look at this, and we need to look at our pictorial traditions and redraft them to make hand-painted animations, which could be part of this 15 billion dollar industry as I speak now from here. So, have you ever noticed? Have you all looked at when you go to these wonderful films? Do you know what I wait for in the end when everybody walks out? Uh, who did the animation? No, the credit lines. Yeah, the credit. And I yeah. keep looking for Indians, 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 Indians. And I play this game with my grandson. And you know, whoever spots as many Indians as they can, and invariably, uh, you find a few now, in a chunk, as a group. Somebody sent a huge one hour of it, say go, 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 do it. And somebody in Trivandrum or Gurgaon, I don't know, maybe Hyderabad, wherever they do it. Now that is content. Unless we do content, unless we create something that belongs to us and is known as Indian, so make in India is not a big slogan. Create in India is. So, Rajiv, if you can just you know, so all of this craft exists. You know, you have the brassware of Moradabad, you have the leather tanneries, you have the weavers of Banaras, all of that. You know. Uh, the question I was asking you earlier is that why have you been wanting to attach the word industry? You know, what is that potential that this entire sector has? So far, it's just been the handloom, uh, you know, emporium in Connaught Place and things like that. It's been a sense of noblesse oblige. It's yeah. been just like the you know the people of taste who will buy these things. Do you see a larger potential in this, which can really become, uh, uh, you know, an industry? It's what is very what is the importance? Very and very pragmatic. Nobody, but nobody, understands words like handloom, handicraft, khadi, cottage industries in the international trade organization. If you're talking about trade, if you talk about locally, continue to rebolster them, repackage them, give them new meaning. But if you're talking about international trade, these words don't exist. But the moment you say creative and cultural industries, there is a pile of material available, and it's industry. Because it's bigger than all the others. If you look at automation and robotics, and I don't know, I'm not sure about jobless growth, but if you look at all this, then you realize that even agriculture couldn't touch the number of the skilled people. That in, every village can have its own product, which can make a mark. Look at look at France. Champagne is registered as a GI. America, if it wanted to make champagne, can't. They cannot. They call it bubbly. They can't call it champagne because it belongs to champagne, chocolates, everything else. That 800 GIs in France. In this country, what are we talking about? So I say, well, file it. Call it industry. If that's the buzzword, if that's the sexy word, fine. I have no problems sleeping with culture and industry. So, uh, Rajiv, what's the big gap? You know, you've been working on this for 50 years. We haven't even started documenting all this. You know, what is the big gap? Is it imaginative gap in government? Is it imaginative gap amongst people like us, privileged elite? Why have people like you and others not managed to create uh, this bridge? You know, why is it 50 years later still a gap? But they go, "Har chiz ka samay hota hai." Shuma, ye kaise na? दस्तकार दरिया काबिलों की उम्र भर जाती है खुद कर लो हिसाब हुनरमंद का एक दिन बेहुनर का एक साल अब हुनरमंद के लिए आपको पहचान की जरूरत है अब पहचान जन्म से अधिकार तो किसी का नहीं है कुछ चीज तो सीखते हैं हम लोग इट कम्स फ्रॉम आर वूम विथ सेल्फ बट आर पेडोगोजीज आर सो कंप्लीटली colonized our entire framework of education refuses to consider the traditional knowledge sector as a meaningful potential so it has to start not with us we are in the departure lounge <laughs> it has to start with the children 
But it will not start with the children till some of us start talking as parents or grandparents saying, why aren't you teaching them this? Why aren't you getting a renowned a potter or a blacksmith or a carpenter to come to teach in the school, teach them the great, the great values of being able to work in this hand. And if you don't wake up, who is going to? You know, 12 million people coming on the road every year with nothing to do, empty pockets, de-skilled, because the schools never gave them anything. I read just the day before yesterday a news item where about, uh, I don't know, 15,000 people applied for a peons job, and it included, it included M MBAs and lawyers and scientists and art students. Where are we going? Why are we... So, Pedagogy is where it's at. Unless we really work out systems of curriculum that marry traditional knowledge systems in mainstream curriculum, not as hobby classes. Beware of hobby classes. When your child comes and asks you, what hobby should I take? Say, first stop calling it a hobby. Get to learn something much more about it. Or we can say, what hobby should you take? You should say, take maths. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. And we should really learn these things. I mean, That's I... That's a wonderful I, one. Yeah. I'm all ears. Take chemistry as <laughs> hobby, take maths as hobby, and actually retain the knowledge systems we, we have and have a, lost. Do you have a child that goes to it? I do. I, I, the main curriculum they have is watching movies, and the hobby that they have now is maths. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you have a headmistress is happy with you. <laughs> I don't know about the headmistress, I'm very happy. <laughs> <laughs> but, but really, Rajiv, uh, you know, you've, you've spoken about this. It's true that one meets, you go to buy a carpet now, and it's not just in India, whether it's in Turkey or anywhere, that there are our generation, as you said, people in the departure lounge, who are saying that their children just don't want to learn the crafts that's been in their family for, for centuries, but they're happier going in for the education that we are getting and becoming a waiter or becoming a salesperson in a mall rather than learning this craft, you know. So again, it is an issue of focus, Rajiv. Could you, um, do you have any vision for the future? I mean, how can this become uh, the kind of central conversation that it should become? Not just out of charity, but because of self-interest, you know, they're, of everything that it holds within it. Sh Shoma, I don't think we have a choice. As I said, when 12 million come, there's another news item in the same paper that I think I saw yesterday, where most of the people that came out in the street to protest, the Dalits, a lot of them were IMM graduates, and they were all these people who were so educated, but they're protesting, they're coming out. But I think one key that I have been working on, and that would have some uh, resonance, because I would love to hear feedback, one of the things that I think has come into our, into our psyche uh, is this um, element of fear, fear of the other. Let's take the easiest way out. Get your child to be a, something that you know, we think is acceptable. Like that, we have fear of everything around us. I mean, um, our neighbors, for example. We, you know, we are... South Asia, I call myself Seishin. We've started a whole project called Seishin Journey, which is South Asian Journeys, where we try to connect with our neighbors in being able to map skills that were artificially divided. What politics did, culture never did. In fact, what culture can do, politics can't. Uh, so we really needed to look at broadening this affair to be able to get a new, fresh, initiative, a sort of a jog, jaded perceptions. And so South Asia has become my field of work and I try to connect whether they are potters in Multan who've got a, a great skill for glazing that has been lost on this side of the border in Rajasthan, a few miles away, or the Jamdani weavers in Bangladesh 
meeting up with the Tanchoi ones in Bangalore, in, in Bengal, or the miniature casters of Nepal reaching out to the ones in Swami Malai where they've lost it. So there are many things, a new energy can come from our looking at the entire sector for creativity and culture from the neighborhood itself. It uh, also will help because it's a neighborhood where 40% of the poorest live and it's the most militarized. So all the money we spend on hating each other and creating more difficulties could go into more proactive. But I was, I got distracted, but I wanted to tell you what we, we had defined creative and culture industry in the, in the in, for I did in, the, in Jodhpur, which is accepted internationally. It says cultural industries are defined as those industries which produce tangible or intangible artistic and creative outputs and which have a potential for wealth creation and income generation through the utilization of cultural assets and production of knowledge-based goods and services, both traditional and contemporary. What cultural industries have in common is that they all use creativity, cultural knowledge, and intellectual property to produce products and services with social and cultural meaning. This is what UNESCO also accepts. <coughs> Yeah, in fact, we should open this up, uh, Rajiv. Just uh, one last question while the hands are going up and the mics are being how passed will, around. How will we see the hands? I can see them. They'll do this. But it'd be good to see faces. <laughs> Some more hall lights would. Yeah, make sure, it more we can intrusive. have more hall lights. So, Rajiv, uh, you know, you were talking about Pehchan. Uh, is there any way of creating more pehchan? First of all, if we, we need to understand that all of this exists. Well, is there any part of this country, anybody who's involved in that process of creating many, pehchan? Many, many. And as I already said, it's not something for a short uh, discussion where the bell will ring again. Uh, we have to really be, of course schools are there, but I can give you countless examples of what reflects pehchan whether it's in textile, or whether it's in the way of song, or dance, or food. Food, all of you can respond, and very soon you'll respond even more. Uh, there is a whole lot of issues that are ingrained into our, into our culture, which talk about pehchan. And it's a, it's a potent, potent sub, uh, word, pehchan. No English equivalent. It's not about connoisseur. Pehchan cannot be translated. And I always trust words that can't be translated. Yes, there's a question there. Thank you, that was uh, wonderful. Since we have a government at the center which believes that everything which is happening now and will happen in the future happened already in ancient ages, what prevents them from really harnessing what is really there? That's a question that answers itself. <laughs> of course. What they, t I mean, um, you know, Oran Khutolas, I did make Oran Khutolas with Madhvi Parikh and all in my airport. When you go to the airport, you can see a whole lot of Oran Khutolas I made with cone tribals. I did them with miniature painters. A whole lot of Oran Khutolas, but I can assure you they didn't fly. And so I'm not quite sure if they were really flying many, many centuries ago. But the answer is there, that those things that are plausible, that are there, uh, should be, uh, are less exotic. They are real, they are in real time, and they should be accepted. But I think it, Dur ke dhol suhavne. Yes, there's a question there. Thank you, sorry. Yes, first you and then you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sethi. Now, the question I can't I, see you. It's very important <coughs> I see you. Thank Some you. More I, uh, very few people thank can you. see me. I'm very short. <laughs> now, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I think one of the ways to deal in this competitive world, as you said, with GI and everything else, shouldn't we scar the country right now and start patenting some of the, let's say, the 
handicraft, handloom oriented industries and techniques before they come up to the WTO Absolutely and right. encourage many of the people working in them. That you're uh, mapping the sector. Mapping the sector is the very first step. If you cannot measure, you cannot plan. This has been my theme song with the planning commissions and with the president Niti Aayog and with whoever I speak to, whether they are ministers in the present government or whoever is taking all the decisions. I keep saying, unless you do a concerted effort at mapping this sector, village to village, and not with somebody going with a proverbial uh, form and a pencil saying, aap kya banate hai, aap kya kar sakte hai, but really understanding a very muscular classification system that we have drawn out, make it accessible, go out and be able to find even a product in a village is a big step. But there are huge skilled clusters. There are people with thousands, there are clusters, regions with thousands of weavers, thousands of, you know, potters and thousands of great dancers and singers and cooks. We have not looked at this sector because we consider it to be less sexy than IT or whatever. So IT for a long time was not even taxed. This sector is now being taxed again. I mean, GST hasn't stopped. The first thing we should say, stop GST for these guys. They are decentralized. It's an ecological industry. It's an industry that comes, which, you know, they're poor people. Why are we applying the yardstick for those things that are coming out of the end of a machine? Why are we doing the same yardstick? And that's what we are fighting at the moment. I'm sure we'll succeed. Yes. Hi, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Rajiv, I belong to the creative industry. I'm a product designer. I'm also an academician, so I teach. And I, you know, I meet a lot of young students who are um, keen to sort of learn product design and hopefully make a career uh, in a few years. Um, so two things. One, um, uh, when I go to the Bombay campus that I teach at and I discuss the Mumbai airport, um, unfortunately, a lot of students consider that as a relic of the past. Already? Already. Um, because for them, it's Departure something... Departure lounge, the flight's <laughs> taken off. <laughs> um, for them, it's uh, It was it's only something... last year it opened. For them, it's something to be encased behind a glass wall. Okay. Something to be preserved, but I think the problem that I have with it is that it's not evolving beyond what it's always been. So that's one. Um, okay. So let me just continue. Yes. So the second question is, um, technology is here to stay, right? We can look at craft in its, the, um, the, and try and preserve it in, in the essence where they belong and how they used to exist hundreds of years ago, which was everyday objects. They weren't relegated to a showcase wall. There were things we used every day. Today, that's not always possible. Today, you have technology that's coming in that's going to challenge the notion of what an everyday object is. How do you marry the two? And is that really possible? How do you marry uh, robotics and Adreno with brass hammering in Muradabad, for example? Well, I gave you one subtle example of the animation industry, where hand painting from the traditions that we have can give a unique edge, a new look to the characters and the stories that we're talking. But that's one that I'm going to be using in a new airport. I shouldn't be speaking. This is the first forum. I'm even opening my mouth. But I hope that the next one will not collect anything to do with arts and crafts. That will all be new media arts. That I will work with contemporary, contemporary technologists to in, with very skilled people to produce something that can again only be done in India. This new high tech and low tech, because they exist, creates magical transformations and that you as a design person should understand. Because if it's, everything is coming out of the end of a computer with something vicarious, as vicarious as the head and as inactive as the fingers doesn't have that 
edge, and I can explain this more in terms of work, not now, later. So I believe also as far as Bombay Airport is concerned, please tell your students that it's not their fault. It's not possible to see that place because there are lots of security restrictions. There's domestic, there's international. It takes me five hours to go through the whole airport. If you don't have the right kind of passes and the right kind of buggies to take you around, you could be there for three days. So of course they could take a flight again and again and again from it and hope for a different door that they come out and out. There are many, many things that I've used, and I have no time here to tell you, which are mixing this idea of new age technologies with this. No, but they haven't seen it. No, but they see it, the eyes would light up. I, we, this is, it's a pertinent question. I don't know how to answer it. I'm an artist. I have to show pictures. And I was told that this is a low-tech algebra, and they don't have, they don't have, they don't have screens to show you. <laughs> Ask them to call me back again with pictures. I have 800 pictures. Shoma well, doesn't take me seriously. No, we, we clearly didn't take him seriously enough. We've relegated him to intimate, where we don't have the LEDs, but we, we really should. But, you know, just to add on to that, I, I think I totally get that frustration, but I'm frustrated with the designers, the schools, the corporates, everybody in this country, because when you go to Dilli Heart, you're right, you may not want to buy that Patachitra, uh, you know, little thing that they do, but if I had a jacket with that Patachitra on it, I would way prefer to wear that than some Zara coat which has no individuality, you know. So just that mixing of new objects with old craft and Marketing. art. Marketing. Marketing. Yeah, Marketing. I mean... But all of that is what we all can do. We are not doing it. And I think that other point that Rajiv has made, that 2% of every building cost is meant to go into the crafts and arts. Uh, Uday Punj and Mangalam Punj's office, they've spent some money doing that. It's beautiful. Otherwise, you go into any office here in Gurgaon or Delhi or Shanghai, there is no individuality. Can I tell you, 2% you know? of Gurgaon would be 60 years of the budget of the entire government of India's three or four ministries that are dealing with the arts and crafts. So, I, you know... Could change in, many things. That's why no we deal, brought Rajiv here to no trigger deal. this audience. Let's make it happen in our lives. Look, you know? the law is not a woman. 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 You should have to understand something. Just last question and then we'll uh, move on. Uh, it's not a question, it's just a, a comment. I found the last uh, altercation quite interesting. Not altercation, but the last dialogue. Uh, yeah, but I must tell you, and Rajiv uh, will probably kill me for it, but I invite all of you to come to the Asian Heritage Foundation in South X. Uh, you will see that what was not possible at the airport has been made possible at uh, the foundation's office. So you've done your plug. There are about 100,000 objects which are part of our collection, which are accessible to everybody. They can touch it, they can hold it. Some have even been deconstructed by craftspeople, artists, scholars for study, and new objects and new innovations have come out of it. So. Airport has its compulsions, but we have, as private people, done what is, what is in our control. Yes. <laughs> okay, one that just absolutely last question. Yeah. Hi. Thank you, Raji, for such an interesting talk. Uh, I work in the area of health communications. Uh, I work with the UN organization, mm -hmm. and uh, we've been talking a lot about arts as a cultural identity. Uh, but what I'm really, really passionate about is uh, using arts to give out social messages. And we did a campaign recently, which was a huge challenge. But uh, thankfully, you know, I had support of our leaders for that, which was using various forms of art for a social campaign. Um, I really want to know from be you careful. what do you think yeah, about be that. Just, just be a little, you know, in the field of arts, 
it has to be, uh, you have to be more tentative. Rather than using art to say a message, it can be very implicit and not so explicit. It's best when it's heard and seen from the emotional retina, when the eye hums into the air and makes the sense and the spirit come alive. Emotion is that where it's all based. You cannot, you cannot package emotion. Artificial intelligence will go wherever it goes. But the next big shift, which machines will never be able to touch, and to be, um, to be aware of, uh, to be intelligent by the heart, there is a mind of the heart also, just as there is a, a mind. Um, I think it's important that uh, we, we do this with a lot of grace and dignity. And I think that doesn't come for the asking. You have to be more specific in what you want to do and then work with artists. Trust artists. Trust artists. They, are, they, are, they live, their nerves are all open. Trust them. Work with them and don't over-program it. They'll come up with the options. Well, I, I... I think we'll have to end uh, because we are not giving you a drinks break in the middle. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm going to really uh, look at this Rajiv conversation as just triggers, you know, like hair triggers to the sheer potential of this. And another sector that we never think about, which is the environment, it's fascinating that it again took a banker, Pavan Sukhdev, to really bring up this idea of mapping the economic value of forests and rivers not because you can trade in it, but because you only start to value it when you realize just in this world particularly, just how much of economic value there is uh, to trees and rivers and grass and birds and animals. And so far, one has always spoken of it as noblesse oblige, as charity, the bleeding heart, uh, copy left, as Rajiv called it. I think something of that revolution needs to come into the creative and cultural industries. If we begin to map it, to understand it, to unleash its creative potential, to marry the modern and the traditional, uh, you know, as, as Rajiv has been talking about, we really are sitting on a gold mine. And the sobering note on that is that at the end of last year, another community that Rajiv has been working with, which is the magicians and performers and acrobats, the Bhule Busre uh, community in, in Delhi, who live in Shadra, their colony, uh, Shadipur Dipur, their colony was broken down. They have been Not promised, broken. demolished, bulldozed. bulldozed, bulldozed. And for more than 30 years, they've been promised 50. Uh, 50 years. They've been promised a colony, a space where again we could take our children, a really beautiful space, a live space beyond the malls. It's taken 50 years. They were not given what they've been promised. Instead, it was demolished. So really, this is a wake-up conversation. I'm giving you a real estate gentleman to make 15 buildings or 15 storied high, which will then, of course, have instant view rehabilitation. But imagine puppeteers and acrobats living on the 14th floor, not knowing whether the lift will work, because it's all not like, like the skyscrapers here. Can it's you give us a five-point flat individually? Not now. If we are times over. But that would be a good note to particular. end on, Rajiv. No, Three I, points I, that they can take away. Point. Oh, that would be easier. That would be easier. I think a very simple one would be to use produce that's made. I don't want to sound like the Prime Minister. I don't want to. I, but, but, but you, where, you know, just like you can't hand over where, saffron to the Hindutva Brigade, you can't hand over made in India to the Prime Minister. No, well, I didn't say, I said it's created in India, not made create in India. Created in India. I already did my one up. But no, I meant that I think handmade and things that you can easily, don't let the machines take over your life. Switch off machines. Be more interpersonal in your communication. Be more interpersonal. You know, just stop relying upon this gadget. 
Be more interpersonal. Talk, reach out, touch, be tangible, be intangible. But do it in the sphere that you and your grandparents and your parents probably also would have done. Bring that back, not as nostalgia. I am deeply suspicious and nervous about nostalgia. <laughs> not nostalgia. Innovate. Bring some new energy into it. Bring this exchange into a contemporary spirit and believe in it. Believe in it. Then support any activity in schools and pedagogy that can bring the next generation closer to this. Hammer the school authorities. Why are you teaching them this? What's it going to get them? Where are you taking them? It's nothing to do with what we have. Be vocal about critiquing what is being thrust down your children's throat to see what it is. There are many more, but I know the time is not right. But Thank you, Rajiv. Thank you very, very much. As I said, a hair trigger conversation. And I have just one more idea to add on to Rajiv's. Maybe all of us can spend 2% of what we spend on either our rent or building our homes in really engaging with craft. You know, let's bring it into our homes first of all. <laughs> so, That's thank a you, rule, Rajiv. by the way. That's a rule. Uh, so, you know, respect rules. <laughs>